Before we dig into TMAO, let's talk about choline and carnitine because this whole thesis rests upon the notion that choline and carnitine found in meat, eggs, organs, and milk are the precursors for TMAO. So people would advise us to take less choline and carnitine. Well, let's back up one moment and think intuitively, does that make any sense? No, it doesn't. This is the evolutionary framework that I always like to have in my work. Does it make any sense that essential compounds, compounds that are very beneficial for humans, choline is a molecule that is part of a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, which is essential for human life. Choline deficiency is associated with all sorts of problems, fatty liver disease, psychiatric illness, et cetera. Choline supplementation often rescues non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Why would this be bad for us? Why would this be bad for us? This is my problem, guys. I believe there's a little bit of a cult in science and we get so myopic, so lost in the weeds that people can't see the forest for the trees. They can't ask these important framing questions. Why would a compound that is in the most essential, the foods that have been at the center of human existence, be bad for us. Again, it's just questioning, but that is the framework with which we must approach these questions. If we cannot begin to do that, we are lost. We will never have a true north. We'll never have a compass. We'll never have at least a hypothesis with which we are going into the work with. If we go into the hypothesis, if we go into the work with a hypothesis that choline is bad for us, where are we getting that notion? It's essential for human life. Almost all of the nootropics on the market, I'm not a fan of nootropics, by the way. I think the best nootropic is liver and egg yolks if you want choline. But all of, almost all of the nootropics contain alpha-GPC. They contain forms of choline. If you want your brain to work better, get more choline. But choline also raises TMAO, so it's also killing you. Do you really believe, and perhaps your answer is yes, but do you really believe that there are compounds in the nutritional space, in our diets, that have been at the center of human diets, the most sought after foods by humans for millions of years, that are good for us and essential, but also killing us? That makes zero sense. Perhaps philosophically, someone can correct me on that, but that doesn't make any logical sense to this simpleton I'm referring to myself. So let's think about car carnitine as well. So carnitine is a, um, it's a molecule that's thought of as an antioxidant, but there's a lot of good evidence that, um, number one, in vegetarians, carnitine and carnitine muscle transport are reduced. No surprise there. Vegetarians have lower levels of carnitine. Is that a problem? Yes, it's a problem. Carnitine is essential for human functioning. We can look at both animal studies, which I'll start with, and human studies. So this is a study in rats, admittedly, but it's acid, uh, acetyl L-carnitine fed to old rats, partially restores mitochondrial function and ambulatory activity. Well, I would say that mitochondrial biology is pretty similar between rats and humans. And so Alcar, which is acetyl L-carnitine, which is a bioavailable form of carnitine, which you could just get from eating meat and organs, improved metabolic function, improved mitochondrial function in aging rats and partially led to restoration of ambulatory activity. Hmm, sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Okay, now let's go further. Here is evidence for a review of the current evidence for acetyl L-carnitine in the treatment of depression. Oh, interesting. Could acetyl L-carnitine deficiency be behind some etiologies of depression. I think it absolutely could. So they say in the abstract, two randomized controlled trials, interventional studies, not epidemiology, showed acetyl L-carnitine's superior efficacy over uh, placebo in, in dysthymic disorder. And two other RCTs showed that it is equally effective as fluoxetine and uh, amisopride in the treatment of dysthymic disorder. Those are prescription antidepressants, guys. Acetyl L-carnitine was also effective in improving depressive symptoms in patients with fibromyalgia and minimal hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, so pretty clear that there's some evidence. I think there are many more trials like this. I'm just showing a sampling suggesting that acetyl L-carnitine can be beneficial in psychiatric disorders. But we're also going to believe that it's bad for us. This doesn't make any sense. Why would we believe that? Just think about it from a very intuitive, basic level. Why would we believe that choline, essential for human life, essential for cell membranes, essential for the formation of neurotransmitters, essential for phosphatidylcholine, the list goes on and on, essential for the transport of bile acids from the biocannuliculi into the, uh, from the hepatocytes into the biocannuliculi, essential for so many things choline is. We know that it's essential for brain development in infants, but yet this is killing us because it's making TMAO in our gut and carnitine. We've seen improving outcomes in old rats, definitely in old humans as well, treating depression, dysthymic symptoms. Technically, those are a little different in terms of how you classify them based on the DSM, but 
for the purposes of this discussion, let's just say that acetyl L-carnitine has a lot of promise in depression, but these compounds, choline and carnitine are killing us because of TMAO. How can this be? I say it's bullshit and I will show you why. As I said, if you look at the mainstream literature regarding TMAO, it's quite frustrating. You see studies like this titled Intestinal Microbial Metabolism of Phosphatidylcholine and Cardiovascular Risk. That is essentially choline. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine, 2013. And they say in the background, recent studies in animals have shown a mechanistic link between intestinal microbial metabolism of the choline moiety, dietary phosphatidylcholine, and coronary artery disease through the production of a pro-atherosclerotic metabolite, trimethylamine and oxide. Where are the human studies in the New England Journal of Medicine? They do not exist. There are no human studies that show a mechanistic link between these things. Is it possible there's something else about the studies in animals that is uh, confounding it? Yes, absolutely. So what's frustrating is that they say there's a mechanistic link as if it's already been established in humans. It has not. And they say increased TMAO levels are associated. This is so confusing for people. And they read these studies. If people are even this focused or even this dedicated, they read the study, they see this word associated, but that doesn't mean causes. And I'll show you why. All we can say is that it is associated. There's a link, but it doesn't mean causal. Think about the first study we talked about at the beginning of this podcast. Choline has various metabolic roles. We talked about it, ranging from its essential involvement in lipid metabolism and cell membrane structure to its role as a precursor for the synthesis of neurotransmitter acetylcholine. I'm reading from the New England Journal and I'm adding my editorialization right now, but it's killing us. Choline and some of its metabolists, such as betaine, can also serve as a source of methyl groups. We talked about methyl groups last week in terms of NAD metabolism that are required for proper metabolism of certain amino acids, such as homocysteine and methionine. Oh yeah, that's also true, right? Uh, we need choline for proper human biochemistry. But again, it's killing you because it's making TMAO. They say we reported an association between a history of cardiovascular disease and elevated fasting levels of plasma TMAO in intestinal microbiota-dependent metabolite of the choline head group of phosphatidylcholine that is excreted in the urine. So what they're saying is that there's an association, and this is true. Studies do show an association between TMAO levels and cardiovascular disease. But remember, we do not know, number one, if that is a causal connection or just a correlation. And we do not know if there is a causal connection, what direction the arrow of causality goes. Is it also possible that things associated with cardiovascular disease could be raising TMAO? Yes, and that is what we will see. That is what reverse causality is all about. Is it also possible that when you have kidney disease, you don't excrete as much TMAO and your TMAO levels rise? Yes. Does that mean TMAO is causing kidney problems or the kidney problems are causing TMAO to rise? I would say it's the latter. There's a lot of good evidence for that, but that discussion gets left out of so many of these mainstream discussions. And I wish I could challenge the world expert on TMAO on that.